All right, so we're diving into pairs trading today. But with a twist, we're looking at how machine learning can give it a real edge. Yeah, using machine learning for this market neutral strategy, it's really interesting. And to be clear, for anyone who's not familiar, we're talking about finding two stocks that historically move together. Right. And then when they kind of drift apart, that's where the opportunity comes in. Exactly. You bet on them coming back together, converging again, profiting from that temporary split. That's the idea. But the challenge is, how do you find those pairs reliably? And how can machine learning help? Well, that's what this research paper we're looking at dives into. Pairs trading via unsupervised learning. It's not just about looking at past price data. Right, because that can be misleading. Sometimes stocks move together just by chance. Exactly. They might not be truly connected. And that's where unsupervised learning comes in. Instead of predicting what a stock will do, it's about uncovering those hidden relationships, the underlying connections. And they don't just rely on price history. In this paper, they incorporate 78 different firm characteristics. Wow, 78. That's a lot. Things like market cap, profitability, even investment patterns. Mm. It's about finding stocks that are fundamentally similar, not just coincidentally correlated. So it's like looking beyond just a superficial resemblance and digging into the DNA of these companies, right? Absolutely. Now, the paper puts three clustering methods to the test. K-means, DBS scan, and agglomerative clustering. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, so these are different ways to group those similar stocks together. Exactly. Imagine them as like sorting hats, putting companies with shared traits into the same house. I like that analogy. So do any of these methods stand out in terms of performance? Interestingly, all three actually beat both the S&P 500 and a typical short-term reversal strategy. Okay, that's impressive already. But was there a clear winner? Agglomerative clustering took the crown, achieved an average annual return of nearly 25%. Wow, nearly 25%. That's significant. And what about the risk? Well, they measured that using something called a sharp ratio, which is basically return per unit of risk. Higher sharp ratio, the better, right? Yeah, exactly. And agglomerative clustering achieved a sharp ratio of 2.69, which is exceptional. That suggests it's not just about high returns, but potentially doing so with manageable risk. That's the idea. So it seems like adding those firm characteristics really made a difference. Yeah, it makes sense, right? You're not just looking at price movements, but understanding the underlying reasons for those movements. It's like comparing two athletes who might have similar race times. You dig deeper and realize one trains rigorously while the other relies on natural talent. Their performance might converge for a bit, but in the long run, those underlying differences will likely show. Exactly. You're looking for companies in the same industry with similar financial structures, similar growth trajectories. Those similarities suggest a more persistent link in their movements, leading to a more reliable pairs trading strategy. So it's about finding those deeper connections. Now, did the research look at what types of stocks these methods tend to pick? Yeah, they found that the strategies mainly selected stocks from the manufacturing and finance sectors. Hmm, that's interesting. Both substantial sectors, lots of companies to choose from. Exactly. Provides a bigger pool to find those well-matched pairs. Yeah. But I'm curious, how did this strategy perform during tough times? You mean like during a market crash? Yeah, like the 2008 financial crisis, for example. Yeah. Did they test that? They did, and the results were pretty fascinating. All three strategies, especially agglomerative clustering, actually held up well. So even when things got really rough, there was still potential for gains. They also looked at the COVID-19 crash and saw similar results. Okay, now that's interesting. Not just finding profitable pairs, but potentially weathering the storm when things get rough. That's a big deal for any investor. Definitely. It's about more than just chasing returns. It's about managing risk and building a strategy that can withstand those market shocks. That's what makes this research so compelling. I agree. This is really eye-opening stuff. But before we get carried away, it's important to remember that this is just one research paper, right? Always more to explore. Right. Always more questions to ask. Absolutely. 
Every research paper opens new doors, raises new questions. For instance, the study mainly focused on the U.S. stock market. Makes you wonder. Yeah, would these clustering methods work as well in other markets? Right. Places with different characteristics, like emerging markets, those are known for their volatility. Exactly. Would these strategies translate well to those environments? Or would they need some tweaking? Good question. And even within the U.S., this research didn't really dig into sector-specific nuances. Right, like how about the tech sector? Innovation is constant there. Valuations can be tricky. Exactly. Traditional metrics might not capture the full picture. So would these clustering methods perform as well in that kind of environment? It's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Sometimes tech companies defy those traditional boundaries. You got it. So while this research provides a great foundation, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Definitely. Makes sense. There's room for customization depending on the market and the investor's goals. Absolutely. And that brings up another point. The research mentioned balancing profitability with diversification. Yeah, it seems like choosing the right parameters for those clustering methods is crucial. You're right. Like, with ketamine's clustering, you have to specify the number of clusters you want. Right. Too few. And you might miss subtle relationships. Mm. Too many. And you might not be diversified enough. Exactly. It's a delicate balance, finding those hidden connections without sacrificing diversification. It's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Not too hot, not too cold. Got to find that just right. Exactly. And it's not just about the number of clusters. It's also about that threshold for identifying those profitable pairs. How far apart those stocks need to diverge before you make a move. Right. If the threshold's too low, you might end up with a lot of trades, a lot of costs. Too high, and you might miss the boat. It's like time in the waves. Got to catch the right one. Exactly. No magic formula here. It all depends on your risk tolerance, your target market, your goals. Tailor-made approach. Now let's talk about those false positives. The research mentioned that as a risk. Yeah. In traditional pairs trading, sometimes you mistake a fleeting correlation for a genuine connection. It's like assuming two people are best friends just because you saw them at a party once. Right. You need more data points to confirm a real bond. And that's where incorporating those firm characteristics helps. You're looking for companies with similar business models, financial structures, not just a random price correlation. Exactly reducing the chances of falling for those deceptive correlations. Looking for a more enduring relationship. Now, this all sounds promising, but how scalable is it? Meaning, could big institutions with lots of capital use this effectively? Exactly. Would it still work? Well, remember how most of the pairs came from manufacturing and finance? Yeah, those are pretty big liquid sectors. Right. Plenty of room to maneuver without moving the market too much. So it's not just a small-time strategy. It has potential to scale. It seems like it. Of course, scaling up any trading strategy comes with its own set of challenges. But the research suggests it's not inherently limited to smaller players. Okay, that's good to know. Now, how does this approach compare to other strategies, like short-term reversal? Ah, <sighs> Good question. Short-term reversal is kind of like betting on a rubber band snapping back. After it's been stretched. Right. You're betting on prices reverting to their mean after a sharp move. Capitalizing on those short-term overreactions. Exactly. But the challenge is, it's a very broad approach. Doesn't consider the specifics of each stock. So with clustering, you're being more selective. Exactly. Choosing pairs based on those fundamental similarities, making it more targeted, more precise. Instead of any rubber band, you're picking the ones most likely to snap back. That's the idea, and the research suggests this leads to better returns and lower risk. Okay, makes sense. But let's be real, no strategy is perfect. What are some of the risks with this approach? Well, one big one is data quality. These methods need accurate data, both on prices and those firm characteristics. Makes sense, garbage in, garbage out. And even with good data, there's the risk of overfitting. You mean tailoring your model too closely to the past so it doesn't work well in the future. Exactly. It's like studying for a test by memorizing the answers without understanding the concepts. You might pass that one test, but you're not really learning. Exactly. To avoid this, you need techniques like cross-validation and regularization. Ways to make sure your model can adapt to new information. Right. Not just blindly follow historical patterns. And then there's the computational side of things. These models can be complex, lots of data to crunch. You need the processing power to handle it, both for the initial analysis and for keeping things updated. So it's not just a set it and forget it approach. Definitely. You need the resources and the expertise to manage it all. Okay, this is giving you a more realistic picture. It's not just about the potential, but also the challenges. Right. 
But even with those caveats, I think the potential of unsupervised learning is huge. It's changing how we think about investing. And as the technology evolves, who knows what we'll be able to do. Now, the paper did mention some areas for further research. Anything that caught your eye? One that stood out was applying this to other asset classes, like bonds or commodities. Interesting. So instead of pairs of stocks, pairs of bonds. Exactly. Looking for those same kind of relationships. That could be really powerful, diversifying beyond just the stock market. And it goes beyond just pairs trading. Think portfolio construction, risk management, even finding new opportunities. Wow, these methods could be a game changer for investors. They already are. It's all about harnessing the power of data analysis. We've covered a lot of ground today, both the potential and the challenges of using unsupervised learning. It's a fascinating topic. Before we wrap up, is there one key takeaway you would leave our listeners with? I think the most important thing is to remember that machine learning is a tool, not a magic bullet. It can't predict the future perfectly? Right. It can enhance our understanding, help us make better decisions, but it's not a substitute for human intelligence. It's about using these tools thoughtfully, understanding their limitations. Exactly. We need curiosity, critical thinking. We need to understand the data, the assumptions, the risks. It's about combining human intuition with the power of data. That's how we make the best investment decisions. And it's exciting to see how it's evolving, you know, constantly pushing the boundaries. Absolutely. It's a reminder that even in finance, which can seem so data-driven, there's still a huge role for human insight. Yeah, it's not about replacing human judgment. It's about augmenting it, giving us new ways to look at the markets. I love that. And I think that's a great takeaway for our listeners. Don't be afraid to dig deeper, to challenge the conventional wisdom. Who knows what you might discover? Maybe you'll find the next big thing. That's the spirit. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground today. Really explored the potential of unsupervised learning and pairs trading. And the challenge is it's important to be aware of those too. Absolutely. But even with those caveats, I think this is a really exciting area of research. It has the potential to really transform how we approach investing. I agree. So to wrap things up, any final thoughts for our listeners? I would say stay curious, keep learning, and never stop questioning. And remember, the markets might seem unpredictable, but with the right tools and a curious mind, you can navigate them and find those hidden opportunities. Well said. On that note, I want to thank you for joining us for this deep dive into pairs trading and unsupervised learning. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And to our listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.